गुड मॉर्निंग फुकार ईशान हाँ गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग कैन यू हियर अस वेल यस ओके आई कैन हियर यू एंड आई कैन वॉच दशी मुख संग गुड मॉर्निंग सारी संग एंड अदर पीपल सो यस गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग वी वी still couldn't meet uh, take you to pune sorry for that <laughs> oh, no no that's uh, really unfortunate I, i was really looking forward to finally coming to pune and uh, see all of you right. but uh, this uh, sudden expansion expansion of uh, uh, probably omicron variant in india prevented me from doing any other activities i just uh, couldn't come to not just couldn't come to pune but i had to cancel all of my all activities mm -hmm. dinners lunches and then many events it's very unfortunate uh, but uh, so nice to see your faces uh, once again uh, and uh, I, i happy new year to all of you thank you thank you happy new year to you also thank you very much same year happy new year sir happy new year sir Happy New Year! Hi. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! All of you, the Shimuk San, Chadri San, and Bari uh, San, all members. Uh, so, so nice to meet you. I'll uh, see, see you once again. Yes. We will wait for two more minutes, and we will start at exactly eleven a.m. हेलो एंड गुड मॉर्निंग मीना बिफोर बिगिनिंग विद सीरीज आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट ऑल लिसनर्स प्लीज कीप योर सेल्फ म्यूटेड एंड दोज हु कैन नॉट ज्वाइन आर जूम लिंक और गेट एनी इशूज प्लीज गो टू आर आई जी बी सी यूट्यूब चैनल वी आर स्ट्रीमिंग लाइव दिस इवेंट वंस अगेन हेलो एंड कोनी छिवा टू ऑल मीना सान आके मस्ते उम्मीदें तो गुजाय मस i hope you all have have a healthy new year you know what this year year 2020 2022 marks the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relationship between india and japan it's huge number right on paper our relationship started with the scholarship system for young japanese students to study in india in the year of 1951 however our exchange between japan and india is said to have begun in the 6th century when buddhism was introduced to japan and the journey still goes on the total vip visits 81 vip visits from japan to india and 113 vip visits from india to japan since 1980 to 2020 and we here we are today celebrating 70th diplomatic relationship between india and japan to celebrate this momentous momentous year the indo japanese business council has decided to host a series of events to strengthen the bond such as lecture series given by veteran speakers panel discussions about india and japan views challenges advanced technologies educational opportunities and many more a fireside chat with chepali where we will be listening and 
inspiring interviews from outstanding and different field. And of course, the most awaited moment and event is Konishiwa Pune 2022. We, Indo-Japanese Business Council, IGBC, established in 2011, is the apex bilateral chamber synerging India and Japan engagement in business, trade, commerce, education, and culture. IJBC is a continually working to enhance India and Japan business and economic engagement. Today, IJBC has a pan-India presence. IJBC provides advisory services at nominal charges through domain experts heading the committees. Necessary helps in assistance of laws and compliances required for setting up business in India and Japan. MSME schemes and cluster in India and Japan. Scaling and employment opportunities. Improvement and technology transfer. Foreign trade and regulations. Our vision is to encourage people, people to people connections, enhancing business and economic relationship between India and Japan. Branding India as an attractive investment destination for Japan, Japanese industry. So a small, a small part of it, IJBC is now working on creating a bilateral directory, where, uh, which is a database of bilingual experts in Japanese and Indian languages. Those who work as a translator, interpreter, Japanese language teacher, Bilingual engineer or a professional having Japanese language knowledge can register this to directory. Those who have not registered yet or interested to register, please visit our website www.ijbc.org. One can also be a member of IJBC and participate in or creating in such events and become part of this celebration. For more details, please visit our website. So not wasting much time, I would like to call President Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh to address the event. Over to Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh. Namaste and konnichiwa. Good morning, all. <clears throat> it's my privilege and honor to be on this dais among with all of you. And I'm very honored to have <clears throat> with us today for an inaugural lecture. Uh, His Highness Dr. Pukahari Yaskata San to inaugural, uh, to do the deliver the inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Buddhism was introduced to Japan in the sixth century. Since then, the exchange and the culture of knowledge between Japan and India has begun. The influence of Indian culture has greatly impacted the Japanese culture which is the source of Japanese people's sense of closeness to India, which continue till date. Even today, when I visit Japan, many people talk about how India and Japan are connected to each other through Buddhism. In a modern history, after World War II, in 1949, Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, on the request of children from Japan, who sent him a letter to send the Indian elephant to Japan. He donated the Indian elephant to the Uene Zoo in Tokyo. This brought the ray of light into the lives of Japanese people who were still recovering from the war. Japan and India signed the peace treaty, established the diplomatic relationship on 20th April, 1952. This treaty was one of the first peace treaties Japan and India signed after the World War uh, II. This is how we are today in celebrating the 17th anniversary of diplomatic relationship between India and Japan. IJBC wanted to take this opportunity to make sure that we not only celebrate this uh, momentous year, but we continue our dialogues and strengthen our relationship throughout the year long lecture series, panel discussions, and people to people uh, connect. But actually, since 1980s, the efforts were made to strengthen the bilateral ties between India, look Asia, Asia policy, and India always to uh, hold Japan at as a key partner and on the top. Cultural exchange picked up during 1980s 
with the help of a local government in japan and india and many cultural shows and performances started showing up all over the japan this relationship continues in 1988 the relations between the two nations however reached to little bit briefly to a lowest due to the pokhran 2 the indian nuclear weapon test that year forced japan to impose the sanctions on india following the test which includes the suspension of all the political exchange and economic assistance however this sanction were lifted within 3 years uh, later on in 2000 the beginning of 21st century witnessed the dramatic transformation in the bilateral ties between india and japan prime minister uh modi's path breaking visit in india in 2000 change several thing and it converted into the japan india global partnership in 21st century as a result of this in 2001 also indian prime minister vajpay visited japan in december 2001 where both prime minister issued japan india joint declaration 2005 we saw japanese prime minister koizumi visited india and signed the joint statement japan india partnership in the new asia era strategic orientation of japan india global partnership as a result of which by 2006 japan was the third largest investor in india this same year in 2006 december indian prime minister manmohan singh visited to japan which culminated into the joint statements towards the japan india strategic and global partnership japan has helped finance uh, financially to build the infrastructure projects in india most notably delhi metro system also uh, delhi mumbai freight corridor dedicated corridor and we are now hearing about the shinkansen the bullet train 2007 was the declared as the india japan friendship year that was the year when the india and japan uh, finished the 50th anniversary year of india japan cultural agreement it was india japan friendship year tourism promotion year and holding lot many event and culture in both countries 2011 india japan conference uh, economic partnership agreement cepa that come into force in august 2011 is the most comprehensive of all such agreement uh, that was concluded between india and japan it not only covers the trades of the goods but services movement of a natural uh, uh, person uh, investment intellectual property rights custom uh, procedures and many more things this this particular uh, part um, ag- partnership agreement was very important in september 2014 prime minister narendra modi paid official visit to japan and had a summit meeting with the prime minister shinzo abe since then this partnership was elevated to the special strategic and global partnership and later on in a ninth annual summit meeting of uh, mr prime minister shinzo abe and mr modi shinzo abe pledged to realize the public uh, public and private investment of japanese yen 3000 3.5 trillion yen doubling the number of japanese companies in india over the next 5 years in 2021 the prime minister kishida held the telephonic summit with prime minister narendra modi soon after he became a prime minister a uh, prime minister two leaders further discuss and elevated uh, uh, confirm their uh, commitment towards the free and open india pacific so so many things has happened in last 70 years and definitely we are going to hear much more from uh, uh, consul general today but as an igbc what we can do about this the first thing come to my mind is that what was the real impact on the ground of course we see so many agreements have been signed so many exchanges happened so many summits happened every year uh, there are new agreements are signed new uh, investments are coming in india but what is the real impact on the ground 
the, I think the the goal of Indo-Japan Business Council is to investigate that. How many Indian students uh, are studying in Japanese universities? Is it really grown lips and bound? How many Indian IT companies and startups are today targeting Japan as a significant market? That question is to ask. How many IT engineers are working in Japan? What is the demand that Japan is projecting and how many of us are able to fulfill that demand? Which are the other areas other than IT to be collaborated? What are the different growth opportunities for India and Japan and in 21st century, especially after the COVID? How to improve the trade deficit? How to tackle the China? Are we considering China as a trade enemy or a partner? Or what, what will be the future? We don't know. How we can safely open the borders for the student business and migrants? How we, we can bring the young generation closer than before in digital area? Because we, we see this lots of happening, digit, uh, the impact of digital area. We are today holding this conference online and so many things are happening. Information is far more easy to access, but still are we as close to each other as we want to see? These are the open-ended questions. And this is what exactly the IGBC, Indo-Japan Business Council, wish to get answers to them and see what can be done. What, what is lie ahead of us to strengthen this uh, relationship. Relationship will strengthen only with the help of uh, three things. Understanding each other's culture, openly have the dialogue, keeping very transparent views, expressing each other's joy as well as their difficulties, and proposing solutions. Every question may not have an immediate solution, but they definitely they have some answers. We can definitely look forward to uh, them. We are not hurry to finalize everything in one year or two years. It's been 70 years, very strong relationship. And IGBC want to do that. For that, we are trying to communicate with different universities, doing MOUs. We are closely working with uh, both sides of government agencies and departments. We want to do some research. We want to bring some white papers out formalize some advisory committees and you know have open conversation and this is this and this entire effort of the lecture series is a part of that so i hope for this entire year we will be able to bring the best in speakers the uh, people who are there on the grounds and doing and we will have it an open that openness and conversation, and we will definitely uh, look forward to a great, great India-Japan relationship in coming years also. So with this, I will close my uh, note here. And thank you very much. And I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm very excited to listen to uh, today, Consul General, and in coming days, all the speakers who agree to come and deliver their thoughts on this uh, Indo-Japan platform. Thank you very much once again. Please enjoy and please don't forget to give us a suggestion. Uh, we are here to listen to you. That's our motto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh. Today, we have our inaugural lecture of the series and we are honored to have His Highness Council General, mm -hmm. Dr. Fukahari Yasukata at Council General of Mumbai, uh, Japan in Mumbai. Council General of Japan in Mumbai, Dr. Yasukata Bukhari san is acting on various diplomatic assignments since last, since last 40 years. In 1983, he joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan just after completing his graduate studies in economics from Waseda University. He completed his master's from uh, Chulangon University and PhD in environmental economics from Vietnam National University. He worked with Embassy of Japan in Burma, UK, Thailand, USA, Vietnam, and India. In 2011, he came to India and worked as a counselor in the Embassy of Japan in India. 
and again in 2020-21 he is and given the responsibility of council general of japan in mumbai ukari san yorosh konegai shimas uh good morning namaskar thank you very much for your kind introduction I'm so happy to be here at this uh, very memorable inauguration uh, ceremony of the launch of a series of events by the IJBC. Uh, since I came here about eight, mon eight months ago, I found that uh, this IJBC is a very important organization uh, for the relation between Japan and India. IJBC has been very active in many fields, uh, business field, cultural field, and uh, human exchanges uh, and uh, have been to that in implementing uh, many activities. So uh, I feel very close to uh, IJBC, uh, even though I am based in Mumbai. And then uh, IJBC is based in Pune. Uh, I was very much looking forward to coming to Pune for the first time uh, for this uh, uh, meeting, but unfortunately, uh, there was a sudden increase of infection uh, in all over India, not actually in India, but in Japan, but uh, all other places as well, which uh, pre prevented me from coming to Pune. Uh, so I had to participate in this event online, but still it's my pleasure and it's my honor uh, to be here today. Because, as I said, that the IJBC is the very, very important organization uh, for bilateral relations. Um, um, Mr. Deshung, the president of IBC, uh, IJBC, has just uh, gave us the wonderful uh, keynote speech. And then uh, he suggested uh, many future directions and, and also uh, placed some questions for me as well. Uh, I try to answer those questions as much as possible. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I officially would like to uh, deliver my sincere wish for Happy New Year. Uh, so we hope that uh, uh, this year is going to be uh, even better and a happy year for all of you. And then also a very good year for Japan-India relations. Um, this is actually the fourth uh, event for me to uh, join uh, activities with IJBC. Uh, IJBC members uh, came to see me in Mumbai twice. Uh, first, uh, Chadri san and uh, Bari san uh, came to see me in, I think it was uh, uh, June. Uh, then, uh, President Deshmukh san, uh, Chadri san, and uh, Bari san also came to see me again. Uh, I think it was in November, uh, so that I saw them uh, twice here in Mumbai. And then I gave a lecture, uh, I think it was uh, October, to IJBC members once. And then this is the first time. And uh, uh, even compared to other important, important organizations in India, like uh, uh, India Japan Association in Mumbai, or uh, Japanese Association, uh, uh, in Mumbai by Japanese groups and then uh, groups in uh, Ahmedabad and other places. Uh, I have uh, been enga engaging uh, more activities with IJBC, uh, including the uh, Konnichiwa Pune. Uh, I also joined the, the, the inauguration event of uh, Konnichiwa Pune, uh, so that this is the fifth time for me to uh, participate in IJBC event. And then my deputy, Mr. Sato, uh, also gave an uh, uh, address at the uh, Konnichiwa Pune event. Uh, so our office, uh, Consulate General of Japan and IJBC has very close relations, uh, even compared to any other organizations in, in India. Uh, so it is really unfortunate for, for me not uh, uh, being able to come to Pune and see all of, you, all of these people face to face but I am sure that uh, it will happen very soon. Uh, for your information, that uh, we, our office has been partly paralyzed at this moment. Uh, that's why I'm not wearing uh, a tie and jacket. I had uh, 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 
a few things to do this morning to contact the uh, uh, corona issues uh, because that, uh, uh, some of the staff members are down with the corona. I think the situation may be similar to you. Uh, like uh, Tao-san, our, our cultural council is um, uh, found to be positive and his family members as well. And my secretary, Vanessa, is also down with some um, uh, coronavirus. And then my chef, uh, Mr. Ikeda, is also down with corona. So that uh, about uh, eight, nine people are uh, found to be uh, positive uh, in this office. So that our function of office is uh, uh, half closed down. So that's why that, uh, uh, that's why I'm not wearing tie and jacket. I'm sorry to say that. Mm. But anyway, uh, even though that uh, uh, our office has been partly paralyzed, and then I have many other things to do, I thought that this is a very, very important uh, occasion for me to be here uh, to see the faces of uh, all of you uh, through the internet and then participate in this uh, memorable uh, inauguration event. Because uh, uh, the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Japan and India is very important, uh, as uh, you have kindly mentioned. Uh, so that we need to implement uh, many activities. Uh, we have not actually given up uh, hope to uh, open the uh, Empress birthday event in February. Probably I have to cancel, I have to make a decision to cancel it within this week. Uh, I'm uh, waiting uh, for a final uh, decision by the embassy. Embassy hasn't also given up yet, but the probably embassy also has to give given up uh, holding the Emperor's birthday reception uh, this year again, uh, so that uh, we may not be able to uh, organize uh, the event uh, to see you, uh, to, to invite you to uh, the uh, to, to Mumbai uh, for the Emperor's birthday celebration. Uh, however, uh, I hope. Uh, we will be able to organize uh, such a similar event uh, soon after uh, this uh, uh, corona pandemic is over. So I positively uh, think that uh, this year uh, we'll have uh, many, many occasions for me to come to Pune and for you to come to Pune, uh, to, to Mumbai, and then exchange views and then see our uh, faces each other for many events. Uh, that's going to be this year. Uh, we really finally uh, start uh, implement activities, uh, not just online, but on site and uh, many other occasions. I really hope so. Uh, India uh, is no doubt uh, one of the most important countries to Japan. Uh, and then we have just started realizing uh, the importance of India. Uh, China used to be an uh, important partner for Japan for many years, particularly after the turn of the century. Uh, when China joined the WTO uh, in 2000, uh, I think it was one, uh, the, uh, Japan uh, came to notice that China is a, a friend uh, in, in the neighbor, very, very close neighbor of Japan. So. Uh, as a member of WTO, we believed that we could contain China and then we could be a very good friends to each other. So that uh, many Japanese companies uh, invested in China uh, for during the first 10 years of uh, uh, this century. Uh, however, China has tend to be a little bit uh, problematic for the region, as may, you may have noticed that uh, China is just an important country, economically speaking, we have to engage China. But uh, uh, China created uh, many problems in the region, like uh, uh, they are uh, not hiding the, their military ambitions. They have uh, expanding their military activities to uh, many parts of the region uh, in the South China Sea. And then India has a military problem with uh, China as well on, on the northern border uh, areas. So uh, increasingly, it has become difficult for Japan uh, to contain China. Uh, as a diplomat, we are trying every effort to uh, contain China and then have a, a, to, to create a peaceful future for us. But the general public and public uh, the, the private sectors have, have, uh, have started to keep distance 
uh, with China. Uh, many Japanese companies uh, have decided to come out from China to relocate their uh, uh, production bases to other, other uh, areas. And then they found India. India uh, is in India to Japan is now that China to Japan about 20 years ago. Uh, we found uh, many Japanese companies and Japanese general public found that India is so such a friendly country. Uh, we share the common values. Uh, both of us based on the uh, fundamental human rights and also freedom of press, freedom of journalism, uh, democracy. Uh, so sharing the core value is very important. And that's what we found out uh, after we had uh, uh, 20 years of uh, uh, commercial relations, economic relations with China. So now uh, people uh, started uh, uh, realize that India could be the real partner uh, of Japan in this uh, uh, in probably 10, 20 years to come. Uh, the size of India's economy is number six in the world. Japan is the third now. So that the third largest economy in the world and the sixth largest economy in the world, if we work together, we could do anything in this region. We may be able to lead uh, the entire world uh, as these two democratic uh, giants get together. And then we may be able to contact uh, some uh, uh, tyranny regime, uh, including China, uh, which is uh, creating some uh, disturbance in this area. We need to contain but uh, uh, So it's necessary for us to work together. And then, uh, it's not just the government, but the common people uh, and the business people came to realize the importance of uh, our two countries' alliance uh, in the future. So uh, just uh, uh, our, uh, just like uh, that the Japanese companies invested heavily in the first 10 years of uh, 20th century, about 20 years ago, I believe that will happen uh, in India. Uh, after I came here, I talked to many uh, Japanese uh, businessmen, uh, managing directors located in Mumbai. Uh, because the Mumbai is the financial capital, uh, Japanese financial giants like uh, uh, Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Mizuho, all those major uh, mega banks uh, send uh, their uh, very capable uh, young leaders to uh, Mumbai. And then I have talked to all of them. And then they, all of them unanimously told me that uh, India is the most important, not just one of the important, most important country for Japan in the financial sector. Uh, Mitsui has, has recently acquired uh, the, the, uh, the financial company uh, of India. Uh, Mitsui invested heavily uh, for that portion already. And then many other uh, mega banks and the Japanese companies are trying to invest very heavily into India in the coming years. So uh, what happened between China and Japan would happen in Japan and India very soon. Uh, I'm quite optimistic about it. Uh, so that our commercial relations uh, will expand differently. So in line with our commercial uh, expansion, we need to expand our human exchanges as well. And then I would like to uh, uh, note uh, again uh, here at this moment, uh, this opportunity that the Japan has opened the door for foreign workers uh, a few years ago. Uh, because of our uh, population is shrinking and our uh, workforce is uh, shrinking dramatically, we need to uh, expand uh, the portion of foreign workers working in Japan. And then uh, we opened new sectors, about 15 sectors, including agriculture uh, and uh, uh, some uh, manufacturing sectors as well, uh, medical sectors as well. Uh, so we need uh, uh, foreign forces, particularly young, young people uh, coming uh, from foreign countries to Japan to work. And then uh, if uh, uh, the, the Indian uh, workers, particularly young Indian, as, uh, working in Japan uh, increases, uh, we can increase the uh, 
human uh, to human exchanges interfaces. Uh, so if that happens, uh, we could expect, expect that uh, real uh, close uh, understanding, uh, mutual understanding of uh, between, uh, between Japan and India uh, would happen. Uh, so we need uh, uh, more Indians, in young, particularly young Indians to come to Japan and work. And then I'm also op 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 uh, optimistic about it. Uh, since we opened the door to uh, foreign countries and then India has uh, uh, many close uh, aspects uh, which can be accepted by the Japanese nationals. Uh, as I said, that we have uh, uh, core values in common uh, so that we can work in many fields uh, without uh, having uh, any difficulties. Nowadays, we have uh, some problems with, uh, with uh, uh, Chinese nationals in Japan that uh, there are about 3 million Chinese nationals that they came to Japan uh, for the past 20 years uh, in numbers. Uh, but uh, as uh, it has been noted uh, uh, by many countries that the Ch Chinese uh, central government, the uh, Communist Party has directed the foreign nationals to abide by their uh, orders. So if uh, Chinese Communist government uh, give orders to foreign Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese nationals working in foreign countries, they have to abide by. Uh, so that uh, Japanese businesses in Japan uh, who are employing the Chinese employees uh, have a little bit cautious about uh, working with the Chinese nationals in Japan. But uh, we don't have any such uh, uh, difficulties uh, for Indian uh, workers because that India uh, is based on democracy. And then all each, each and every Indian has uh, uh, respected the freedom uh, so that uh, we can work together. Hmm. Ah. Uh, so that is a direction. So we hope that uh, uh, human exchanges will expand, expand uh, between Japan and uh, India. Uh, uh, as uh, you have kindly mentioned that the history of Japan and India goes back to the sixth century. And I have recently read uh, the Buddhism documents, which was introduced to Japan in the sixth century. Uh, very, very old documents called uh, Hokekyo and uh, Ke Kegonkyo, uh, which are the basis of uh, Buddhism uh, introduced in Japan from uh, China uh, in the sixth century. And then by reading all those old, oldest uh, Buddhism documents in, in Japan, I found that there are many, many uh, Indian words, Hindu words, uh, Sanskrit words are described uh, in the documents, like uh, uh, names of a god like Indra or Brahma, uh, Agni. All these god's names are included in these Buddhism documents, even though this is document, uh, Buddhism documents. Uh, since it was written uh, first in, in uh, Sanskrit in India, uh, the name of the gods and the names of people are all in, all in Hindi names. Uh, so that uh, the name of a uh, god like Indra, uh, Agni, uh, and uh, uh, Brahma, all these uh, uh, main gods of uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu religion are introduced in Japan, 6th century. So that uh, since the 6th century, Japanese people are familiar with all those Hindu gods. Uh, and then, uh, because of the introduction of the Buddhism through all those uh, uh, Hindu books, uh, many uh, Hindu tradition has introduced in Japan as well. Uh, as you may have noticed that the Shintoism is, is very, very similar to uh, Hinduism. Uh, we have uh, three gods uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, Kojiki. Kojiki is our oldest story like uh, Mahabharata or Ramayana. Now we have three gods, main gods. Uh, uh, which is very similar to uh, three gods of uh, India, uh, Brahma, uh, Vishnu, and Shiva. Uh, Indian people believe that all those three gods uh, created uh, the world, and then Brahma in the middle. Even though Brahma's uh, presence is very, uh, the, uh, uh, um, um, uh, Vishnu and the Shiva are uh, enormously popular, and then Brahma is not so much popular. And, uh, which is, that is the same in Japan as well. We have three gods. The central god is called uh, Ame no Minakanushi, but uh, the first presence is uh, 
whose status seems to be, whose status uh, must be the highest actually, but still the popularity among the Japanese people, this uh, Minakano is the lowest. And then the, there are two other gods uh, are born uh, at the same time, uh, uh, have uh, um, other roles like uh, maintenance and then uh, 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 re reconstruction. Uh, sort of similar to Bishan and then uh, Shiva. So all those uh, main characters of gods in the Japanese Shintoism and then Hinduism are similar to each other. So Shintoism, Hin, uh, Hin Hinduism are very, very similar. Uh, so we have uh, spiritually speaking, mentally speaking, we have many things in common. So we can understand each other. As uh, Asians, we have a uh, uh, similar culture, not just the culture, but we have a spiritual uh, uh, aspects very similar to each other. And then economically speaking, we are the, the, uh, well, our economy is based on a democratic system, Western system, uh, free trade and others. Uh, so uh, from spiritual to business to political uh, system, we have many, many things in common. And then there's no, uh, worry for us not to uh, uh, work together. So there are challenges, of course, at the, how to materialize all these uh, uh, positive aspects into uh, the actual uh, events. Uh, uh, here in Mumbai, I need to act, uh, uh, I need to be very active to introduce the Japanese companies to India and then Indian companies to Japan, and then uh, mobilize the uh, flow of uh, humans from Japan to India, and then from India to Japan. Uh, that is a challenge uh, uh, in front of me uh, for us to do here in uh, Mumbai at the Consulate General Office. But the uh, general direction is uh, fine, as I said. What happened uh, to, Japan, to Japan with China would happen uh, in India now. So, for that direction, uh, we work together. Uh, last week, uh, I celebrated uh, the uh, launch of the bridge, uh, Trans Harbor Bridge between uh, Mumbai Peninsula and then Nabi Mumbai, which connects uh, uh, these two sides uh, uh, with the India's uh, longest bridge. Uh, the bridge will complete in uh, 2023 two years from now, uh, about two years uh, uh, to complete. Uh, so that we, we, we launched uh, the final phase of the uh, bridge construction. Uh, this bridge is going to uh, link two sides, Mumbai and the Navi Mumbai, with only 20 minutes. Now it, it takes about uh, more, over two hours, 120, 130 minutes from Mumbai to Navi Mumbai, that portion but it's going to be connected uh, with only 20 minutes. And then which uh, probably uh, it makes it easier for us to go to Pune uh, using that bridge uh, so that uh, uh, the, the access between Pune and uh, Mumbai will be much easier uh, so that our commercial activities will ex expand between two cities. And also it will enormously reduce the uh, discharge of carbon dioxide. Uh, because uh, it uh, shortened the travel time. Uh, we are also introducing the uh, uh, high-speed railway between Ahmedabad and uh, uh, Mumbai, which is going to complete in a few years. And uh, we are also uh, uh, installing many metro systems here in Mumbai, which will also uh, reduce the carbon uh, dioxide emissions and then uh, make it uh, easier uh, for the local people uh, to live. Uh, so many uh, developments are, are taking place uh, in Mumbai between in, in, uh, for the activities between Japan and India. Uh, so uh, I really hope that uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, problem will soon be over. And then we could uh, uh, reestablish our normal activities so that the seventh, uh, seventh years anniversary year will be the milestone between Japan and India for us to expand uh, dramatically uh, to the future friendly and the prosperous uh, relations between two countries. 
Uh, having said that, I would like to conclude my uh, speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech and helpful insight. It was very interesting to know that not only Buddhism was all, and also Hinduism was there present in the sixth century in Japan. And, and you, as you truly said that if the third largest economical country, Japan, work together with the sixth largest economical country, India, we can do anything. Yes. Let us work together to forge a vibrant India-Japan relationship for future generations. Further, I would like to invite uh, Vice President of IJBC, Mr. Abhishek Chaudhary, to give vote of thanks. Over to Mr. Abhishek Chaudhary, sir. Thank you, Ramesh Shishan. Uh, I'm very happy and uh, glad to share that uh, we, are, we are starting this new year with lots of events. Uh, and, and to inaugurate this, having CG San here, uh, is, a, is a proud moment for all of us. <clears throat> so before I uh, go for our uh, vote of thanks, I mean, uh, definitely thank you. Thank you, Sijishan, for your wonderful speech. I'll, I'll come back once again uh, with uh, a formal vote of thanks. But uh, before that, uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions, Dhanas Sijishan. Uh, we, we have some time, so uh, why not we check if there is anything in the youtube this this program is also uh, is, is live on youtube so uh, we might find some questions there or anybody wants to ask any question i have one question if i may ask yes yes uh, uh, this, yeah. uh, first i would like to uh, thank you for bringing me in and uh, uh, it was really nice to listen to both of you and uh, you know really get some perspective and uh, so first, I, I am um, uh, Hemant Nutalapati. I'm an assistant professor in Shimane University in Matsue, Japan. So I'm speaking to you wrong, from Japan. Uh, so one simple question I have uh, to uh, the Council General is that how do you compare uh, the business environment? Of course, there are many uh, surveys from Jetro and so on. But post-COVID, where are we failing? compared to Vietnam? Vietnam? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was in Vietnam uh, from uh, 2003 to 2005. I spent nearly three years and then been to Vietnam many, many times. Uh, so that I can, I'm in a position to compare uh, Vietnam and India. Uh, for me, there's a lot of similarities between two countries. And then, as you may have noticed, that uh, the, the number of companies and then a trade between Japan and uh, not just Vietnam, but the ASEAN area is 10 times larger than India. That's exactly uh, why I'm asking this question. I'm sorry yeah, to say that. Yes, so, the uh, uh, business of Japan in Vietnam is uh, prospering and then uh, they're expanding uh, rapidly. And then I try to find out the, the reason why the division's activities are so in India, while the uh, activities in ASEAN are so large. And uh, I asked this, uh, the same questions to many, many uh, business people. Uh, and then nobody actually could give me the uh, proper answer. And then uh, probably uh, my uh, conclusion is that uh, there's no difference. It's just an uh, uh, image and the uh, timing uh, which uh, caused the difference between ASEAN and India. And then India's population is uh, twice large, large as uh, ASEAN's population. So market is double size here. And then, uh, as I said, that uh, India is now sixth largest economy in the world. It's larger than France. Uh, so based on the fact that there's no difference, I mean, the socially speaking, and then in the in the in, uh, with a view to uh, regulations and rules, uh, India has uh, uh, fair rules and common rules for foreign uh, companies, so that uh, competition is very fair here. Uh, if 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 uh, you invest in a country like China, that uh, uh, we can't actually uh, expect the, the uh, fair and open uh, regulations from the government, but that. Uh, here, we can expect a fair and open 
uh, rules from the government. Uh, so even though competition, com competition may be very high, uh, but uh, that is okay for businesses. Uh, so what happened to ASEAN and Vietnam could happen in India. That's the conclusion of me and the co conclusion of many business people located here in Mumbai. Uh, so they just need some uh, uh, timing probably. Uh, also some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, trigger events, uh, which could, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, start uh, we said they are uh, thinking about uh, the situation in India. Uh, they are, at this moment, India is not, to, not, not very much known to the Japanese businesses. And then uh, Japan is not very much known to the Indian businesses as well. So if we get to know each other, uh, if we understand each other properly, there's nothing which uh, prevent us from expanding our businesses so that uh, uh, what we need to do is to uh, spread the image, proper image of uh, two countries to each other. Then uh, we, uh, we can expect uh, that uh, business development which happened in Vietnam and other places in ASEAN could happen soon in India. Thank you very much. And uh, that is, uh, really underlines the potential that uh, the future holds. And I'm sure uh, IJBC is really you know, doing uh, working in that area to bring people together. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, one more question in the chat. Uh, let me read it out. This is from Kavita San. Uh, I'd like to know the opinion of uh, Fukahari San that what kind of energy cooperation we can see in future between India and Japan in the next five years. Uh, energy, yes. Uh, uh, energy is very important area. And then uh, the first thing that which comes into my mind is the clean energy sector. Uh, Japanese companies are trying to uh, invest heavily into this clean energy sector and India as well. Uh, Prime Minister Modi also introduced his plan to uh, uh, expand the uh, clean technology and the clean energy uh, in India as well. Uh, so that uh, uh, we could uh, uh, co-work uh, to uh, mutually expand the uh, energy, uh, clean energy sector uh, between two countries. Uh, nuclear power plant uh, was the most important target uh, from the viewpoint of Japan to India uh, until uh, several years ago, but. Uh, because of the uh, Fukushima uh, power plant actions that it may not be the uh, option, but uh, yeah, still some people consider that the atomic, uh, uh, atomic power plant is the very important clean energy uh, uh, yes, device so that we may need to look into the possibility. But uh, yes, uh, new clean technology like solar energy or uh, tidal energy or uh, earth energy, all those uh, clean energy sectors. And then uh, for cars like uh, uh, hydrogen uh, engine uh, cars, uh, the hybrid uh, cars expansion in India market, all those uh, fact, uh, sectors uh, uh, need, need to be looking, looked into uh, for energy sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, fukari -san. Uh, now we have another question from uh, Mr. Sudhi Jaswal. Sudhi ji, would you like to just uh, ask the question directly? Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. And thank you for this insightful presentation. Uh, Fuka Harisan, you are in Mumbai. Uh, look forward for a time to take your time and meet you in person. I'm also based in Mumbai. Uh, my question is that, of course, I totally agree that there is huge potential between India and Japan to work on various aspects commercial and education and cultural. Uh, my question is specific to education because we see a lot of students going out from India to other countries mm -hmm. and also coming to ASEAN and yeah, the discussion we had in Vietnam specific, a lot of students come to Japan from ASEAN countries. What can we do that, you know, 
can work as a trigger or catalyst for students of these countries to know each other well and look forward for the benefit coming from that because the benefits are huge it is known to everyone so my question is what possibly we can think of to focus in this direction uh thank you very much that's a very good question actually that is the question i'm asking asking to myself uh, uh since i came here all the time we need a trigger yes uh, uh there are many uh, foreign students coming to Japan to study from China, Korea, uh, and then other uh, countries, and the USA, uh, European countries as well. But the number of uh, students coming from India is very small. Um, uh, we have an uh, uh, official program introduced by the uh, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, but the number is very small because we have to use the taxpayers' money for that program. In order for us to expand uh, the number of students from, from, from countries, the private, uh, private students uh, must increase. All those uh, students studying in Japan, from, most of the students studying in Japan from, uh, from a country like uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, China, and uh, uh, Koreans, so they are private students, not uh, sponsored by the governments. So uh, we need to provide uh, uh, incentives to private people uh, for them to uh, come to Japan and study. But I understand that uh, it's not only India, but uh, any other countries uh, that the first priority is go to uh, USA and the UK and Australia to study because of uh, language, English. Uh, I, I, I I had I I was I participated in the uh, selection process of uh, examination by the uh, Ministry of Education uh, scholarship uh, program for foreign students. And then I know that uh, the, the many foreign students uh, uh, wish to go to USA, UK, uh, European countries, and also there because of the language uh, issues. And then only tiny portion uh, of students consider that Japan is a first priority. Uh, so, we have a uh, heavy disadvantage because of language, as you may have noticed that uh, in Japan, uh, not many people speak English. Uh, so uh, even though uh, Indian people can speak uh, English uh, fluently, that uh, they can't actually use English in Japan, that they, they need to understand the Japanese to communicate with the Japanese people. Uh, th that is kind of a barrier uh, which we need to overcome. Uh, so, in order for us to increase the private students studying in Japan, we have to give incentives. But the government money is very much limited. We have to provide incentives from other way, not just the financial, uh, not, not uh, from the financial uh, support. Uh, so that is a big question. I've been thinking of what would be the trigger for India students to, to come to Japan. Uh, one sector which can, uh, which has has been providing a very good trigger to uh, overseas students to other countries, the uh, animation and the game. Uh, you know, uh, Japan is the still leader uh, in in the fields of uh, animation, manga, comics, and also games like Nintendo and uh, Sega and all those uh, uh, gaming companies uh, are, are very popular in many countries. So that young people who are interested in animations and the games, uh, they have chosen to come to Japan as a first uh, foreign country, first, first uh, priority foreign countries to uh, come and study. Uh, so we need to uh, encourage more in this field, animation and uh, gaming and uh, the pop culture sector for to uh, to invite uh, uh, young, uh, capable Indian people, but uh, we need to uh, uh, provide more incentives for, for example, the top, top science uh, sector Indians to come to Japan to study. We need some more incentives because of the, those uh, science field uh, Indian young uh, students uh, tend to go to USA, UK, and uh, Australia uh, to study, not Japan. So we need uh, to find a way, but uh, I don't have an uh, answer yet. So let us work together to find a trigger uh, 
attractive trigger so that we can increase the number of students uh, coming to, in, uh, to Japan. And also, I would like to encourage uh, Japanese uh, students to come to India and, and study. And then I'm, uh, I'm uh, taking every opportunity. I'm uh, actually uh, uh, recommending India to Japanese young people, uh, saying that uh, India is a wonderful country. India has the uh, common value with Japan. We have many things in common uh, from culture, from culture to spiritual aspects and then business aspects. So that there's no reason for any young Jap Japanese people to come to India and then study. So I am personally encouraging that we need to do it uh, at the national level so that we need to increase uh, more exchange of students. Uh, so the uh, answer is that uh, I am still looking for, for, looking for the answer. And then let us work together for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh Actually, I have a suggestion for you. Uh, it's basically on my personal experience about the ex uh, students uh, going to Japan for studies. Uh, when I was in ninth mm -hmm. grade, I, was, I had the opportunity to learn Japanese language because I was very fond of Japanese culture at that time and now also. So from that time, I have, I'm very glad that I... I started to learn a new culture and new language. Later, I was not able to continue, but right now when I, uh, I am graduated, I'm a graduate student, um, mechanical engineer, I graduated in 2021. Then I, I was planning to do master's in uh, any abroad country. So when I was when I was uh, searching for it, I found one course, which is an uh, IMAT course, which uh, it is provided in Rich Jamaican APU. So, yeah. And then later, I thought I should give a chance that I, many of the students go to western countries like european and other american other south american north american countries so i see in my continent actually so in my own continent and then that's why i was japan and one one thing i want to say, one thing I want to say is that uh for to student, for the younger student, younger generation in or in Japan, which we can uh, do is we from the very young age. I think in the uh, school age, uh, school time actually, we can uh, start a language club class or something like that. So it will be very nice because uh, what. Uh, what I got interested because in Japan is from the school time. So I think it's very good if we started like this. And other thing is I am ba based in Kopoli, which is a very small town and exactly, which uh, comes exactly at the center from Mumbai and Pune, 80, 80 kilometers. So uh, yeah, I, I means I don't, I was not knowing of what is IGBC actually. It is my first se session attending was my first time attending this session. So I was not knowing. So uh, we can have some awareness program also like uh, like this. And uh, you, uh, you told us about the many other cu cultural exchange and industrial exchange programs. So that will be very helpful if we can uh, get, if the students can get to know about this. Thank you so much. Arigato. Mm. Uh Thank you very much uh, for that point. Uh, that is very important point. Uh, uh, the studying language is very important uh, uh, factor uh, for us to expand uh, the uh, the human to human exchanges. Uh, actually, those who have uh, interested in Japan, the studying in Japan, have a strong tendency to come to Japan and uh, work. So that, uh, um, as you have rightly said, that uh, expanding the number of uh, students for studying in, in the Japanese language uh, is important. And then we've been working to that uh, uh, direction as well. We are asking the uh, uh, Indian governments, including Maharashtra government and other governments, to introduce uh, Japanese as a second language to universities or maybe high schools. 
uh, which uh, uh, we have uh, uh, succeeded in some of the schools in the USA uh, to introduce the Japanese language as a second language at the high school level. Uh, so if that happens, and then if uh, uh, the, the, the young people uh, start studying Japanese language at a uh, young age, uh, they will increase the number of uh, uh, foreign students studying in Japan. But uh, the challenge is that uh, from uh, countries like uh, China, uh, Korea, and the USA and other countries who have sent many students in Japan, they are not necessarily studied Japanese language uh, when they are uh, back in their country. But they came to Japan for many other reasons. That uh, uh, One reason is that they came to Japan because uh, some of their friends are in Japan, some of their families are in Japan, and uh, their parents and then, uh, their relatives are doing business in Japan. That, that's the kind of uh, uh, reasons for them. Uh, so if we increase the number of uh, uh, Indians in Japan to some extent that we may have some multiplying effects uh, so that uh, um, taking any measures, we need to increase numbers. But yeah, thank you very much. Language is a very important sector. So we try our uh, efforts and then work together to increase the uh, number of Japanese courses at the universities and the high schools possibly. Thank you. And one more thing, uh, uh, Fukai yeah. uh, is that yeah, the in the, the in the mentality of Indian parents is not is like that. But uh, they only send their students, uh, they only send their uh, kids to the European countries and uh, America, US, UK, like that. So, uh, awareness yeah, program for you know, parents also will do. Yeah, so uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Miral san, for your uh, questions, suggestions. Uh, we have actually a few more <laughs> questions lined up, so uh, let me uh, quickly take that up. Uh, I, I, I can see that uh, um, Gitima, Gitima Das has uh, raised her hand. So, Gitima, would you like to ask the question? Yeah, you are on mute, Gitima. Thank you so much for taking my question, uh, Dr. Fukahari. Uh, it, it is indeed a pleasure to listen to you and the way you uh, talked about the collaboration that India and Japan can take forward. And this is the first time, I must admit, this is the first time I'm listening to an uh, event organized by IJBC. And let me first introduce myself. I'm Gitima Das Krishna, and I'm heading the Northwest Desk of Invest India. It is the investment promotion agency of India. And uh, we are the Northeast Dex, which was started last year. And we were wondering how we can take it forward with the Japan government, because there is a close affinity of culture in Northeast and uh, Northeast of India and Japan. Say the Buddhist culture, Buddhist circuit that we have in Northeast. Uh, or the culture like the Magnum comics or the pop culture or something like that. There's a lot of similarity and people here want to learn Japanese. They have their, I know people who have learned the language and they have, they want to work. There is a skill set available with the young uh, Northeastern people here. So is there something that we can do? We can take the next step forward and bring in, uh, attract some investment into this region from Japan, would really like to know if that you're thinking about along that lines or if there is something that we can do as a next step. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for your activities and interest in, the, uh, in, in Japan and especially in the cultural sector. We have many cultural programs uh, uh, sponsored by Japanese government and then uh, you may need to utilize some of them. Uh, so, uh, it depends on the concrete directions which you are thinking, uh, we may be able to uh, assist uh, uh, your interest. Um, at this moment, as I said, that our cultural attaché is done with the corona. Uh, he may be back to the office in, by, uh, within 10 days and then we may be able to uh, discuss on that portion. So, please feel free to uh, make a call or visit our office uh, to our culture section. Uh, we can exchange views uh, so that we can uh, could uh, find uh, a proper solutions for that. I mean, uh, can we get the coordinates of the or the email ID of the person we need to contact? Uh, 
Yes, uh, uh, um, I, I can give you the later. My, my uh, name is uh, Mr. Kauchi is the, uh, the our consul responsible for that aspect. And also uh, the Indian lady called uh, Apurva, Apurva-san. Uh, she is oh, the uh, Indian uh, staff members who are working in the cultural section as well. Okay, um, it, it so, must be um, there in the website. It must be already mentioned in the website. Ah, yes, I, I think, yes, you can find uh, okay. the names in the website. Mm. Okay, uh, thank sorry, you so I, much. I don't have any programs at this moment, but uh, yeah, we can work together in the future. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Arigato. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Upkar Singh. Upkar Singh Ji, would you like to ask you a question? Yeah, good morning, Mr. Uh, Yashukata. Myself, Upkar Singh Ovoja, I'm president of Chamber of Commerce in Punjab. So, uh, we work a lot for with Japanese companies here. And uh, at uh, Chamber, we are conducting many Japanese programs. Like recently, on 27th, we will be conducting a Kaizen competition. Then, uh, training on Poke Yoke, a lot of trainings because uh, this part of the country, we are mostly manufacturing units. So, and mostly they're supplying to Honda, Maruti and Japanese company. So we do a lot of activities which are aligned with the Japanese manufacturing system, Toyota manufacturing system, lean manufacturing. So I, a lot of companies here in Ludhiana, they want to have collaborations or technical tie up with Japanese company. So how we can take it forward? Uh, I, I have a question from you and also share your email ID or details uh, or through IG, IJBC. We can want, we want to uh, make more program related to Japanese industry and how to connect better with the Japanese industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the line wasn't very good, so I couldn't uh, listen to some of the portion, but uh, you would like to expand the business activity with the Japan, Japanese industry. That is the question from you? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, right. Uh, first of all, I like uh, your, your Japan. Urban, Urban, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Looks very Indian to me. Uh, yes, yes. Please, please come to Punjab. Yeah. You will see uh, many Urban people. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I received many similar questions from uh, Indian uh, industrial sectors uh, people uh, how to connect uh, uh, their companies to the Japanese companies, and then some of the industry portion. Uh, th there should be many ways. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, Japanese companies are completely open, they are private, not just, uh, uh, it's not uh, controlled by the government. It's not like China. Uh, so that uh, any any companies have a freedom to do business by their own way. Uh, so it's totally free up to you to make a contact with any Japanese companies to establish relations. And then uh, if you have uh, some uh, overall information about Japanese, uh, Japanese business activities in India, you can go to JETO. Japan external trade organizations uh, in uh, in India. Uh, they have office in Pune as well. They have office in Mumbai. They have office in uh, Ahmedabad. There are many offices of JETRO in uh, in Japan. But they are they are sort of one window uh, for Japanese businesses and then for Indian businesses. So uh, from the government point of view, we just, uh, uh, I'm just I'm able to say that we have a JETL, which uh, uh, solicitates the, the private activities, but uh, we, we cannot intervene into the private sector activities. It's up to private sector. Uh, so uh, our advice from the government side is very much limited. But at, uh, once again, I would like to assure you that uh, uh, we have we we are installing the completely free business system in Japan, like India. So 
you can do anything. If you feel like uh, talking to some Indian, uh, the Japanese companies in Japan or in India or any other places, you can go and directly uh, see those people and then discuss business issues anyway. And if you come up with some programs, legal programs particularly, you can come to us and then ask for the help. help. We received uh, many legal issues from the Japanese companies or Indian companies to address. But uh, apart from those legal issues, it is up to the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, uh, let's just take a couple of questions from the from our YouTube followers, and uh, then we will uh, wrap up the event. So Dhanushree San, uh, please, uh, yes, if you yes. can volunteer. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Abhishek San. So we have some questions from YouTube as well. Uh, one question is about the industrial sector only. Japan government wants human capital and talent to go to Japan, but corporate sector in Japan does not carry good image of India and prefer work for, workforce from Asian or even from Nepal. So what steps would you like to take to improve this image of India for Japanese business sector? Mm. Yes, that is the, also the question which I'm asking to myself uh, uh, ever since I came here. And then that is also the question for the Japanese managing directors located in Mumbai as well. Uh, I talked to the managing directors of businesses in, in in, in Mumbai, you know, many uh, so, so, uh, mega banks and then uh, manuf manufacturer giants, uh, all those companies, um, major companies located in uh, Mumbai, they are asking the same questions because for them, Mumbai is a, such a nice place. India is a, such a wonderful place for, for, for them to uh, deploy and then expand the businesses. So they are sending their views and the information from the offices in Mumbai to headquarters in Tokyo or Osaka in Japan, that uh, India is the uh, one of the most important future uh, uh, market for Japanese companies, their companies. So they should expand their businesses in India. But the uh, headquarters take a decision to expand their activities, yeah. not in India, but the countries like uh, um, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, all those um, uh, Asian countries, and then China uh, or European countries, the like USA. Uh, so that uh, we don't know why. Uh, I don't know why. And then uh, Japanese businesses here do not know why that the headquarters take such decisions, not to make a decision to relocate their investments to India. Uh, probably, as you mentioned, that it, it's uh, image issues. We need to change the image of India uh, to Japan. And then those who are located in India have already they, they changed their, uh, their images. Their images of India is very good, totally renewed. Uh, India is not different from uh, uh, other uh, Asian countries. And then uh, they are, cultural uh, level is up to the level of uh, Japan, and it's, it's very similar to each other. So we can uh, share many things in common. There's a solid ground we can work together. There's no difference. But uh, still, uh, headquarters do not make decisions. So we need to change the image. But uh, how to change the image of Japan, image of India in Japan, in their uh, headquarter people's mind is the question. And then it's a challenge for us. But it's gradually changing. Uh, nowadays, that the uh, news report, and then through the SNS, that uh, news of India has been uh, introduced in Japan uh, at many levels. Mm. But uh, we don't know. Uh, some people consider that India is a country of a caste system. And the image of caste may be uh, creating some uh, hidden barriers uh, for the business between two countries. But uh, living here in India, that is not actually a problem uh, at all. So that uh, we are also reporting that aspect to Japan as well. Uh, anyway, it's image issue, I guess. So that uh, we need to change the image, but we don't know how to do it uh, properly. That is a challenge for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is about uh, waste management is a huge issue in India. Japan has wonderful waste management in place. 
why Japanese companies not been able to work in this field in India despite of being in India for long? Uh, I think it's a similar question, I guess. That, uh, uh, what, what, uh, no, what? it's about waste management. Oh, waste management. Oh, I see. Well, right, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me just paraphrase this because this is oh, an sure. yeah, I know it well. So, uh, so Fukari san, what is happening is that uh, waste management, waste management starting from segregation uh, <clears throat> to reuse and everything is a big problem in India. And there are a lot of efforts going on and then the Japanese companies are also coming up, but in not in a very big way. There are a lot of good technologies available with uh, Japan, which uh, Japanese companies can uh, bring in and probably that could be a part of CSR activity that they are doing. So what is your opinion? You know, <clears throat> hmm. What do you think as far as that particular problem is concerned? Well, um... I think there is an agenda not only for India and Japan, but for the entire world that we need to create a better world to introducing proper waste management technologies and practices. In Japan, that we face a similar problem that we are wasting about 10% of foods every year. So that if we could control the 10% waste of foods in Japan, that we may be able to uh, increase of our GDP and then uh, create a better society, um, which is which is also uh, same in India as well, I guess. So this is the uh, the area which we've been working for many years, but it's uh, at the same time it's a new area uh, seeing the uh, future of the uh, based on the SDGs and the others. Uh, so I don't have any uh, answers which we could do, but we can work together. Uh, since uh, this problem is the common between Japan and India, and then this is an important area for us to tackle, uh, we may uh, get together and then uh, find solutions. And if there's uh, any merit uh, uh, doing jointly between two countries, we should do it. Uh, so we we'll look into the future possibilities for us to work together in that sector as well. So that, that is the answer for me at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So I think uh, we are done with all the questions. Do you have any? So um, I can see just only one last question for now. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Krishnan, and he's asking that uh, is any Japanese company coming to manufacture semiconductors for auto industries in India? So uh -huh. there is anything, uh -huh. any upcoming plans? At this moment, uh, uh, I, I don't have uh, any information about the pro uh, uh, any concrete uh, plans uh, from the private sectors, but uh, uh, companies like uh, uh, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, or Maruti Suzuki, uh, they have their own plans to uh, expand uh, their businesses here, including some semiconductor portions. Uh, I don't know if uh, they are actually started start uh, uh, producing semiconductors uh, here in India? Probably not, uh, but uh, that's the most important uh, aspect. Sorry, of in uh, uh, nobody has started anything on in this matter. Everybody is for the lithium battery working on Toyota-san and uh, Maruti Suzuki-san. Mm -hmm. I worked for Maruti Suzuki-san for 31 years. So I know a little bit in the auto industry. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know. You, you are in a better position to answer the question. I, I understood, no, I understood. I, even I asked uh, Daikuku-san in Jetro, but he couldn't, uh, could not answer at that time also. Mm. Uh, that's why. Oh, uh, yes. Sir, that, uh, for, for your information, By any chance, you know uh, about this, please share with us. That's all. Mm. OK. Uh, the you know the shortage of uh, semi semiconductor is the, the issue uh, in the global uh, community uh, this year and the last year. Uh, so Japan needs to change their uh, industrial policy uh, to uh, produce more semiconductors in Japan. 
Japan used to be the number one country for the uh, semiconductor uh, production about 30 years ago. But uh, that position was uh, taken by Korea, China, and other countries, and Taiwan particularly. Taiwan. Taiwan. Taiwan, yes. Right. But Taiwan's uh, the largest uh, semiconductor company has recently decided to uh, in, uh, install a plant, manufacturing plant in Japan, in Kyushu. Uh, so uh, we may be able to increase uh, the, the production of semiconductors in Japan. So that uh, it's not only Japan, but the many, many uh, countries are uh, changing their production policies. Uh, so we don't know uh, what, what's going to happen in the future. But it's also important for India to to uh, establish their manufacturing points of semiconductors in India. They are trying, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you want to Thank you very much. Uh, for further co connections or for further detailed questions, you can write us on info at ijbc.org. So, uh, Dhanushishan, just uh, oh, pardon me, one one uh, last thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, we, we recently, so uh, Sijishan, we have uh, uh, recently conducted one MOU with uh, India Japan Laboratory of KU University. So just to share more details, I'd like to request uh, Tomo Kawane-san to uh, come online and uh, speak for a minute on this partnership. So Kavane San, please. Kavane San, are you there? Hello. Okay. Uh, I think Kavane Sun is logged out, it seems. Uh, so let me just quickly share. So, Sajisan, so what do we have? I mean, uh, it's, it's a really good effort from IGBC and KU University. So recently we have conducted one uh, MOU with uh, the KU University where we will be working on uh, various exchange programs as, as well as uh, writing up uh, white papers for policy making uh, which will help uh, making specific policies from both the countries and uh, this this india japan laboratory basically the theme of this india japan laboratory is that uh, they are they are organizing online um, exchange programs and one of that is on you know uh, animation so uh, animation and yoga and this platform is called Injan Pulia. So Injan Pulia is the platform that is being uh, uh, organized. And this platform where people can come, connect for various uh, cultural interactive programs. And uh, for further, one can visit um, India Japan Laboratory, HTTPS double slash India Japan Lab dot org slash JP. Thank you. Over to Dhanashri San. Thank you, Abhishek San. So I would like to further go for a vote of thanks and okay. over to Abhishek San again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, my heartiest thanks to uh, CG Yusukata Fukahari San for accepting our invitation and as well as delivering this wonderful lecture and also patiently answering all our questions from uh, various members. I would like to also thank uh, uh, Siddhar San for spearheading this uh, whole program. Uh, Siddhar San is always a uh, big inspiration for all of us to move forward and his vision to create strong bonds between both the countries and basically people to people exchanges between both the countries is something which keep all of us motivating. So thank you Siddharth San. I also would like to thank Dhanashri San for wonderfully managing this. So thank you Dhanashri San. And thanks to all the participants. Without participants, no events can 
be done. So thank you everyone, and thanks for asking such wonderful questions. I think this this year we will see a lot of these questions coming up. A lot of the deliberations will continue, and finally uh, we will be at a stage where uh, we will create better ties between both these countries. So once again, thanking uh, Vanessa San and everyone at. Uh, CG Sun's office, Consul General's office. They are very kind and they keep always helping us whenever we are asking them for any support. So with this, I'd like to conclude today's event. And if I am misthinking anyone, it's just that it's not coming to my mind that as of now, there is no deliberate missing up on thank you. So thank you thank everyone you for your help and support. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abhishek San. With this, as Abhishek San said, with this, we are concluding today's session. But however, we are going to come back with our next lecture. It will be by President of Discover India Club, a distinguished scholar, diplomat, educator, and musician, Dr. Rabindar Malik. It will be on 18th February, 4 p.m. IST. So till then, stay tuned, get updated with IGBC website, and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Namaste. 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 Thank you. Thank you.